If you do B2B sales, you know that it's a relationship business. The truth is, every business is relationship. And that's a part of growth. In this interview, I'm talking with Patrick Baines. He's the CEO of Nerdwise. And what they are is a company that helps out B2B companies. They help them get the right processes, systems, and things in place so that you can grow. See, in our conversation today, you're going to hear that there's a certain evolution that happens within your business, meaning by your own struggle, your own will, your own determination, you're going to get to a certain level and then you'll tap out unless you unlock the keys to the next pieces of that evolution. We're going to talk about those pieces inside this interview and why it's particularly insightful and helpful to hear from Patrick. Well, he's done it several times, and this is a great conversation that can give you some of those insights. So let's dive into this episode right now. And if you do have questions about Nerdwise, you can go check them out at nerdwise.com. This is not a sponsored episode. This is an interview that I thought would be really helpful for you as listeners. Uh, my name is Patrick Baines. I'm the CEO at Nerdwise. We provide a all-in-one sales enablement and, and lead generation solution for B2B sales teams. Hey, Patrick. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. So I'm, I'm going to start out with uh, something that you know, but you don't know specifically. And this is this is a good compliment. So when we are looking for vendors that we're going to work with, or we get people that are uh, starting a new relationship with us or pitching, um, oftentimes the their companies will say, "Oh, we're the we're the greatest at X Y Z." But here's something that's amazing for you as a listener to know is when the representatives from Patrick's company reached out to us to schedule this interview, we did research to find out if he's legit, if Nerdwise is legit, if Nerdwise is legit and everything else. And then we saw your marketing and you guys killed it. Like you guys have retargeting ads in place. Your marketing is just on point. So this is going to be an amazing conversation. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad to hear it's working on uh, wor working on the podcast host. But yeah, I appreciate it. Definitely. It, it took a long time to get the foundation and all the different channels going, but we're, we're pretty happy with our marketing engine. Awesome. So let's let's talk about uh, the marketing engine. But specifically, this conversation we're going to have today is to help out people that are focusing on that B2B growth. And since this is business growth, uh, we're always having conversations uh, down different paths, but B2B is one of those that, you know, not everyone has really figured out how to unlock. So first off, let's set a foundation, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, well, I, I think, you know, at, at a high level, we systematize a lot of sales activity that has to be happening anyway. Um, and, and it has to be both kind of happening in, in a, a, a high quantity of sales activity to drive meetings and opportunities and customers, but it also has to be happening in a very high quality and targeted way. Um, so what we do is we work with tends to be sales teams of anywhere from one to 10 where maybe they don't have a marketing leader in-house yet, um, and they don't have a reliable system for their own uh, prospecting and lead generation efforts. Maybe they've got some markets and things that they are focused on, but they're really doing a lot of the, the grunt day-to-day uh, -day activities themselves. And I always point out, you know, tools like Marketo and Pardot and Outreach and Mixmax, and the reason these are multi-billion dollar companies is because they have found ways to help uh, systematize and, and, and scale up a lot of core sales activity. Um, same reason MailChimp just sold for like $12 billion. I mean, you know, MailChimp, that reaching out to your customers wasn't something new, uh, but, but doing it with a system that lets you do it at a greater scale and still with a high degree of quality 
is incredibly valuable. So um, that's what we do is, is we look to find um, parts of the sales process that a human being, somebody who's got a high degree of intelligence and, and can be very thoughtful about how they spend their time, we look for those opportunities in their process, in their activity, and in the system as a whole that we can augment using uh, technology. And, and, and so we implement systems on everything from identifying who your target clients should be and kind of having you know, laid out bulk agreed upon research of, hey, here's the companies, here's the individuals we're going to go after all the way down to outreach and follow-up. Um, you know, you pointed out we're doing some things around retargeting um, and like how, how we can help uh, companies and individuals nurture their pipeline um, and make sure that nothing really falls through the cracks. Uh, so that, that's what we do is we implement those systems uh, for organizations and provide everything from strategy to messaging to technology and, uh, and try to get it going very quickly and effectively for them. So on, on the B2B front, you're, you're, you've stated that, uh, you know, there's this threshold and we'll call it one to two million in sales, you know, 20, 30 clients, whatever that may be. And it, again, it depends on the industry, but we can generalize in there. And from my past experience and people I talk with, a lot of them never get past that point. They just kind of stuck in no man's land when they've, they've bought a high paying job. Have you seen that as well uh, with the clients that have interacted with your company? Well, even it's even funny to say to, to think about it now at like one million or two million because it took me a long time to get there. <laughs> so I think there's many levels even before that that uh, you know entrepreneurs can struggle with to get to that first million. Um, but like I said, brute force, determination, uh, patience—you know—a lot of those kind of the, the, those those qualities will take you very far. Uh, as an entrepreneur. And so I, I, I don't know if it's even, you know, I, I can remember being at a quarter million a year and hitting my ceiling and, and, and it ended up not being a, a sales operations issue as much as it was fundamentals inside the business model that I needed to be intellectually honest about, whether that was who we were targeting as clients, what our pricing model was. We didn't have long-term contracts. We didn't have a great renewal process. Some of these things I had to learn the hard way, um, and and with those in place, I was able to have a more effective uh, sales machine and 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 be able to grow my business more effectively. So I don't know that it's always sales it, it, when you're when you're a smaller company. It's not always a sales issue. Um, it could be that you need to just be iterating more more quickly and more kind of honest, be more honest about what's working and what's not. Um, as it relates to the foundation of your business. Now, if you've gotten to half a million a year, 800K a year, a million a year, you probably have a lot of those things right. You sh should still be iterating constantly, but you're, you're at a place with those revenues that you can start to build out real sales operations, that, those, that, that your, your pricing model, your target customers, a lot of those things should be very validated at a million dollars a year, at least I would hope so, unless you're like, You've got like a million dollars in revenue and it's across two clients, then you know that's that's not necessarily a healthy business model, although it's not a it's a good problem to have, right? Um, for a lot of people. So anyway, I think I think that's that's sort of one thing to keep in mind is to get there, to to get to that one million, you have to have done a lot of things right, or at least been made a lot of the right changes typically to have 20, 30, 40 customers and a million or two in revenue. Um, then it becomes more of a sales ops, uh, you know, how can we accelerate our, the way that we're going to market and, you know, the number of leads we have and our close ratio and the size and duration of our contracts, you start to kind of get to that, that next level of, um, performance where you're, you're, you're kind of more tweaking things and doubling down on them than you are, um, you know, figuring out the, the key, the key ingredients. You know, you, you unpacked a, a few things in there. One piece is uh, having a really good operator. Once once you have a good operator, someone that's running ops for you, either a GM, director, or whatever that could be, that's a differentiator because I've seen uh, in businesses in that level of sub a million, and and it could you know depending on your pricing, it could be sub five hundred thousand a year. Um, 
brute force you can get through it with sales but without an operator like you're hitting a ceiling and you might not even know what it is like what to be paying attention to so for you you've you've had several different companies uh if if you wouldn't mind kind of going through and talking about the different ceilings that you saw uh for you and then what you did to break through and then we definitely want to go into unpacking some of the b2b strategies early on as an entrepreneur and this is such a classic saying but you don't know what you don't know and you know it's very easy focused on the wrong things um a lot of people focus on their product not their not their customer um they are obsessed with an idea of something that they and it could be the best idea in the world and that may be it's right you don't you don't you don't always there's there is no one formula uh so i'll i'll, I'll always say that there is no one formula but there is a formula for you that you have to figure out and you got to be constantly like a scientist you know changing in and out variables like how's this price point how's this how's this customer segment um and taking the information that you get back and making educated you know iterations forward for for the business and kind of testing out uh new things constantly i mean i i've made just about every mistake you can make in business i'm i'm not even I'm I'm not done making them. I know I've got a lot more uh, ahead of me, and and so I think you know direction over speed is uh, is something that you got to really embrace in the you know the beginnings. Let's say the first one one month to one to two years of your business, and by that I mean like whatever space you're in, go look at who are the key players in the space, who are the markets that they serve. Even if you've got something that you think is completely new and novel, you know, someone else has already solved that problem another way and, and, and talk to them, talk to executives at those companies, get their feedback, um, talk to their customers, talk to your customers, right? Um, go join those entrepreneur groups, ask, ask them for 30, 45 minutes uh, to, to run through some of your challenges. And there's just a lot that you're, you know, if you, if you've got the right direction first, if like, like, so now, for example, if I were to go start a business tomorrow, I would do a lot of things directionally better than I would when I started. I, I would not be, I, I you know, well, it depends on what, what the business is, but I would not be so product focused. And I was, I was, I obsessed over my ideas, my solutions, the things I thought were so cool and novel for way too long. And not that I obsessed over them, but I thought that the market will catch up and they'll think this is cool as well. And in reality, you've got to listen to the market um, more so than listen to yourself. And, and so anyway, I think that there, there's a lot of that that has to happen up front is just working on kind of being intellectually honest and working on your direction, constantly tweaking it uh, until you, until things really start to click. Um, and, and you'll know when they click, when you start to see, you know, how many interactions with prospects it takes for you to get a customer or an opportunity and then a customer. And when you start to see that that's becoming easy, easier and more predictable, then, you know, you can move on to the next problem, which might be, you know, retention or, you know, results, generating results and then retention or something. Yeah. And, and there's always an, another problem. And that's the fun part of, um, and, you know, with, with the world that we're in today, I I've seen it and, you know, I've been a, a, we should call it a guilty party of being too focused on the product. You know, I've owned uh, various companies and whenever that happens, uh, it just keeps me siloed. And then once I sit there and, and I reach out and actually find out what the customers really want and then put the right people in place, things explode. So let's talk about some of that B2B growth. You know, you, you have the opportunity of being around some of the greatest companies you guys raised, is it correct, eight million in your round? Uh, my last business, yeah. Okay, and then Nerdwise, you guys are out there. You're, uh, I'm not going to use the word hustle in that term, but I mean you're getting on it. You're really making it happen. You're connecting with business owners, and you're probably seeing characteristics like, oh wow, you can probably point out and say these guys are going to make it in in this in this world. What are some of the things that you keep on seeing pop up every time from the best people in that are using Nerdwise? It's interesting. I mean, we we have kind of maybe two two big diff. We we have a we have a we have a few different buckets of customers, but but broadly speaking, there's two. One is 
we've got a lot where it's still the owner operator who is taking the meetings and closing deals. And we have the, the other, the other group of customers, which is where we're supporting a growing sales team of could be two to five or more uh, sales reps. And uh, there's a lot that sort of separates the winners from the, the losers, if you will. Um, I, I will say it's, it's, it's very enlightening and almost tickles me to be able to see, we have hundreds of clients. We can see how their kind of marketing performance is uh, again. So I'm basically able to, to get insights into how their target markets respond to various value propositions and who's got the rocket ship and who's got the, you know, the, what's, what's a lemon, right? Like a car that's just not moving. You know, they assume that their value prop is one thing, but in, in fact, it may or may not be, or may, it may be that that is the value prop, but it's not necessarily the right market that they're aligned with. I'll give you an example. Uh, we work with about 75, a little over 75 IT consulting companies, MSPs, and they're all different flavors of the same business. Um, some of them focus on cost savings, some focus on cybersecurity, uh, some focus on very specific verticals like financial services or, or law firms, and some you know, might focus on large uh, you know, 5,000 person companies where they want to be their co-managed provider. And you know, fundamentally, these businesses are very similar. They're, they're offering IT solutions for other, other businesses. Um, but the ones who are the most successful are the ones who they've got, they're further along in their formula. So they've got already a stack of customers inside of a category like, like financial services. And so now they can focus on financial services and take not just their value prop, but their credibility to that marketplace. And they're speaking the language of their target clients and they're, they have a message that resonates much more so than the ones who their earlier stage, they don't have the experience serving those other markets. So they're kind of faking it till they make it still. Um, of course, working with a partner like us helps them, helps kind of guide them uh, further, you know, further along than, than where they are today. Um, but we can't always go in and, and, and kind of accelerate the narrative of each client. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wanna, and I'm gonna oversimplify this. So again, very oversimplified, but it in many cases, are you saying that it comes down to the customer being understood by being able to speak their language and know what their real problem is? And then the other piece is having trust so that the relationship can accelerate. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, I think so. I, I also think it's about, you know, being, um, it's just it, like some, some of these things just take time. You know, you just you have to be in the game for a certain amount of time and you've got to get all of the, the, the things that come with that with that time and that patience. I mean, that's that's one advantage I see is companies that have been around longer. They know they're you're right. You know, they know their customers better. They're able to establish trust quicker. They've got probably a, a better communications on their website, a little better online presence. You know, you mentioned at the beginning of the episode, you were impressed by the way that we showed up. I mean, if this podcast interview was two years ago, you would not be so impressed, right? And and maybe you didn't consider having us on as a guest. So you just kind of continually iterate. And it's, you know, I've heard a lot of people compare business to like having a kid sometimes because it has to, it has to go through its stages. It has to grow, right? Very rarely do you, you know, give birth to a business and then it just shoots up and it's 30 years old, like overnight. And it's like got everything, customers and credibility and a great brand and all those things that take so long to achieve similar to like having a kid they can't just go from like infant to you know uh college uh, age or 30 you know 30 years old whatever you have to you literally have to put in the work and so um yeah but once you put in that work you get all these other things right you get the the knowledge the lessons of you know the learnings of the markets you serve you get better uh, uh honed in on your value prop you can handle meetings more effectively there's a lot of things that come with it so unfortunately, you know, I think for, for most of us humans out there, you have to put in the time, you got to make the mistakes and, and you've got to just keep working at it. And that's what ultimately helps you accelerate, I think, you know, down the road. Yeah, so, so very true. Uh, I'll, I'll throw in an exception and, and to not uh, be insensitive. So no listeners take this way, but uh, using the reference of, uh, you know, raising a child and you go through the infancy, um, you can do an adoption 
which means buying a business. Um, it's costly and it's not always what you're going to expect. And that can accelerate it. But again, there's unique challenges within that as well. Great analogy. Um, yeah, great analogy. I, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't want to be insensitive to anyone, but I think that's the easiest way to put it. I would love to wrap up for you being able to help listeners understand what NerdWise, or not even using the name, but just saying what your organization does. Because you guys are a people-faced organization and you're not a fit for everyone, but for the people that are, it's something that helps them along. So can you wrap up with that? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think that if, if you can, you know, almost every B2B company is grown off the same metrics. And, and like I said, at the beginning of the conversation, you need the, you need to drive the metrics both on a, on a quantitative you know, level, they need to go, you need to get in front of more new target clients every day and every week to get more meetings, opportunities, and customers, but they also need to be high quality. Now, if, if you have found you know, who your target client is and you know what your value prop is and, and, and you, you've got it, you, you know, you're checking these boxes and you're like, yeah, Patrick, I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, then start to systematize those, those numbers in your business. Start to identify, okay, well, hey, look, if we serve financial services companies, that have 20 to 200 employees. Let me go ahead and identify who they are in bulk, not one by one by one, right? Like, let's go and get a list of who are those financial services companies in my state or in my region or in a random region out there. Now let's go ahead and say, oh, let's go, let's systematize our outreach a little bit. Let's bring in a marketing automation tool and let's, you know, talk to an expert and, and start to put systems around a lot of that stuff so you can have increased uh, 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 pipeline development, increased sales productivity. Um, there's a lot of great books and resources out there. I'm a big fan of um, uh, Predictable Revenue. If you if you haven't checked out those guys, uh, they they put together a lot of really great playbooks and videos around how to systematize a lot of that. Um, but that's you know that's that's what I think is the key is if you think you've got your product market fit and you've got some traction and things are going well try to try to dial up your numbers and don't, you know, don't, don't go from zero to a hundred, but iterate and steadily increase and, and see what you can do to, um, you know, to keep, to, to, to keep the growth going, but in a way that you're working smart, not hard. And, and your, you know, your, your, your team is putting their energy where it's best spent, not, you know, doing kind of rat wheel activity. Yeah. You don't want to create burnout on your valuable employees and team members. What's a way that, our listeners can follow up and maybe get a demo, talk with someone on your team, or even just give a shout out to you and say thanks. Yeah, I mean, nerdwise.com, uh, LinkedIn's always good, Patrick Baines or, or Nerdwise on LinkedIn, and come find us, say hello, don't be a stranger. Okay, good. well, we'll make sure to put that in the show notes. And for you listeners, hopefully some of these, you know, little nuggets in the conversation uh, turn you on and are able to help you out in your business. And you're able to take a gauge of see where you are in the business and if you are just you know cruising along things are good and you know that you got to get to that next level and maybe you don't know how to break free having someone on the outside help you do that is the piece and if you're still struggling at the very beginning and you can't afford getting someone then doing less but more of the things that are better are going to help you out so patrick Great conversation. I appreciate it today. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate it.